Well, I have not got DT-itis, and uh, so we'll pray, pray for you guys afterwards. I don't know if you saw, just I picked that microphone up like it was toxic. And so no one touched the green microphone at the front, otherwise you may be coughing away. But wow, well done guys for having an amazing week. Um, similar to you, I was suffering while you guys were camping in a field. For those of you that were serving our young people, we were suffering in Paris. And so uh, <laughs> it was our joy to be in Paris last week and um, Livy and I were on holiday. We went into a French restaurant and like all good British people, what do you do when you go to visit a foreign country? You download Duolingo. <laughs> And so uh, I was uh, training fiercely on uh, eight lessons of Duolingo, and so naturally I was feeling like a fluent Frenchman. And so when I arrived in Paris, I sat down in a restaurant and I was feeling overconfident. And so uh, we went in, we sat at the table, and I went, Bonjour, monsieur, which means, hello, sir. And uh, he went, bonjour. We took a seat. He came back with the menu, and um, we had a little bit of a chit-chat in French. And I've got quite limited French, and so uh, I, I did merci beaucoup. <laughs> Are you impressed? I thought I was going to get a little ooh for that. <laughs> uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, the problem was he then asked me a question several times in French. And at that point, I went, ah... Uh, <laughs> Parler anglais, which means speak English. Uh, and he went, uh, you don't speak French? And I went, petit pois. <laughs> At that point, the game was up. Because that means little peas. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I went, okay, I can speak a little bit of French, but uh, I'm actually English. And so at that point, things went downhill. Uh, he went, you can try. And he carried on speaking to me in French. He would not speak to me in English from that point. He, he made me work for my dinner. And so we had a laugh at my expense. And so in that moment, I thought I was doing pretty well. And I, I thought I'd ordered the grilled salmon. I was going to get a nice hot meal. And I did OK. I did get salmon, but it was raw. It was salmon tartare. And so I feel like Joe Lingo sort of helped me out a little bit. But it turns out uh, sentence structure matters. Right? When, you're, when you're asking for something in a different language, structure is really important. And this is the tedious link, because this morning we're talking about structure. Hip, hip. Hooray! It's the thing we all love. Last week we talked uh, about um, having fun, the creativity that comes with light and art and the beauty of God creating the world. And we gave you permission to actually enjoy yourselves. That was good, right? Well, let's have a pendulum swing back today. We're going to talk about structure. Let's just rein it in a little bit. And so hopefully you've had a really fun week. But actually, structure is a part of God's plan for our lives. And we've been taking a look at the creation story in Genesis chapter 1. And each week, we're looking at a day of creation. And what we are saying is that we are created to create, that we have a creative God who, and we, we sang that song, um, was it called? Uh, indescribable. I couldn't even describe the song then. Indescribable. And it talks about this beauty of God's creativity as he creates the world. He breathes it into motion. I always feel sorry for anyone who's been struck by lightning when I sing those words. Who told every lightning bolt where it should go. Um, if you've ever been struck twice by lightning, that's really unfortunate. Um, but, but it paints this beautiful picture of God's creativity, God's passion. And we are made by a creative God, and so we are created to create. And what we thought we'd do is recognize that as we come to Jesus, we are a new creation in Christ, that we explore everything God has, that God has put inside of us and use it to his glory. And so what we've done is we've created a cross frame down here. Someone's already put a couple of items in the box. But essentially, if you've got an item you can fit in the palm of your hand, it needs to be quite small, but something that represents an interest, a passion, something of your industry. Someone's bought a syringe filled with blood because they work in the medical profession. I'm so excited to see that go in this cross. And then we're going to pour a resin over it, and it's going to be a cool, quirky piece of art that will be worth millions. Okay, it will be worth a fortune. It will be so great. Or it might just be something a little bit interesting. Um, but either way, it represents that we all have something inside of us that God has put inside of you. He's created you for a purpose. He's created you to create. And so this morning, um, we're talking about day two, structure and design. And this sermon is going to be a little bit like shaking a fruit tree. There's going to be some things that fall off that you want to grab and eat, some things that you might not want to be able to eat because you want to just latch on to one idea or one thought, but maybe it sparks something in you to appreciate the purpose and design that God has for your life. And as we've explored the book of uh, Genesis in chapter one, we recognize that these 
opening chapters, they're written in stanza, they're written as verse, they're poetic, and they flow back and forth, and each day has evening and morning the first day, evening and morning the second day, and it flows with this picture of who God is, and Genesis isn't really concerned with how it all happened, it's concerned with why, it's concerned with who God is and who we understand him to be, that he set everything in motion and he is interested in his creation and it tells us something of God's character. And so in day one, we had in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Existence came into being through God and then you see the God, uh, so you see God's spirit hovering over the waters, the Ruach of God, and we describe that as wind, but it's far more than wind. It's more like a thunderclap. It's a whirlwind. It's a, a, a shock in a moment. And so this is the presence of God, and he speaks the world into being, and the Bible tells us that there's light, and there's an expanse of light that appears, and creation begins to set in motion, and the earth is formed, and then we arrive in day two, and it's just as beautiful, just as evocative in terms of its creativity. And what you realize is that God is creating a space for things to happen. God is creating space for things to happen. So before there was nothing, there was chaos, there was darkness, God creates our existence, and then you have God forming the world. And isn't it true that structure create space for growth. Struct- you, know, you don't want to admit it, but it is true. Structure creates space for growth. That when we have structure in place, we have a space in which things can happen. And things can grow, things can thrive, but usually they need care, they need attention. If you imagine it a bit like a, a vineyard, that would be a great example. We're a vineyard church, a bit like a vineyard, and you have a load of grapes, and grapes are viney things, and they grow, and if they don't have structure, they just sort of sprawl all over the place. But the best vineyards have a support in place. They have poles in the ground. They have arches in which these vines can grow around because when you create structure, there's space for more growth. There's space for things to thrive, and so God creates a space where things can happen. And so we're going to read day two together. If you've got a Bible, would you turn with me to Genesis chapter one? Uh, It's really easy to find. It's at the very start of your Bible. Uh, And if you've got it on your phone, you can just scroll to it. It's even easier. Um, If you haven't brought a Bible, don't worry. I'm going to read it out for you. But this is what it says in Genesis chapter one. Day one uh, has already happened. We're into day two, verse six. And it says this, and God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And so there's a very short kind of reading here. There's very little seemingly happening on day two, but really what's happening on day two is the space for everything else to happen. God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. And on the earth, the picture that's being painted is this ball of water. And that actually, there's, there's nothing else. There's no space for growth. There's no space for land. There's no space for air. There's no space for anything to take place. And then God speaks. And the word for speak in Hebrew, last week we looked at a few different Hebrew words and some really mean exactly what they say. The Hebrew word for day just means day. The Hebrew word for night just means night. And these are concepts that are reflected throughout the Bible. But the Hebrew word for God speaking is quite interesting. The word is amar. Everyone say amar. Almost sounds French, but it's not. Don't say that to anyone in France. Uh, Amar is Hebrew and it has around 40 different ways of being understood. And what you get when we read the Old Testament, it's written in Hebrew. Apart from the book of Daniel, that's written in Aramaic, but it's original language. It's all in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in ancient Greek. And so ancient Greek is somewhat easier for us because it's a conceptual language. It works on ideas and principles and connected ideas. Hebrew is a felt language. It's not so much about what you say, it's about how you say it. So when you speak Hebrew, you do it with a bit of passion, you do it with a bit of feel, and it gives you the concept around how the word is said. Well, amar is the word for God speaking, and it can mean several different things, 40 different ways of being understood. Uh, One of them is speak, command, thought, determine, certify, or arrange, or define boundaries. As when we see God speaking the world into motion in 
speaking the world into existence. It's not like the idea that comes to mind is pop, the world is made. Right? It's not kind of like a, a, a children's cartoon where it's like, there's the world. There's there too. There's day three. Like, it's not this kind of sprawling of things just happening necessarily in an instant, but it's God setting things in motion, setting the world up in structure in its existence. That actually we have a pattern that we see in nearly every aspect of life. It's something God ordained. Think of it more as a domino effect or a catalyst. God begins something and it continues, and it keeps going in motion, that actually there are laws of nature, there's laws of gravity, hold on to your seats right now, if you break them, you might float off, no you won't, because there's gravity, it's a principle, it's set in motion, it's something that is not easily broken, if ever, that actually even within your DNA, there's a pattern that's replicated, it's something that is set in motion, and when God speaks, when God commands, when God says, it sets something in motion, straight away, When I think about leaning into my faith, it's interesting that when God speaks over your life, he sets something in motion. Have you found this to be true? Have you found that actually when God speaks over your life, it's not like things happen necessarily in an instant. It normally sparks something off in you. It's normally a catalyst for change or it's normally a catalyst for you to step into something. That command is an arrangement for things to happen. And so, on day two, God speaks. And he says, let there be a vault between the waters. And to separate water from water. Now, it's a little bit of a weird concept. Separate water from water. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, that looks a lot like the sky. If I'm looking at the poetic meaning of this, of of what is it that God is creating here? It's the space in which things happen. We've got water below, which is the oceans. In Hebrew, thought waters above is generally the clouds. It's where the water comes from above. And what God does is he separates these waters. And this space in between is where we exist. It is the space in which life happens. It is the space in which we go about our day. It's when we look out and we see the sky. And we've got this dome shape of space, which is called the atmosphere. And that is more the picture of what is happening here in Genesis 1. This expanse, this curvature that holds the earth keeps the water below and the water above it. It's probably best understood as the atmosphere. And it's interesting when there's a structure in place, there's space for growth. Now we have this space in which we can exist. God has created the world. He's created a space where we now be. And in that space, things can happen. Things can take place. Because when you have a structure in place, you have a space for growth. And so, verse 7, Genesis 1, God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. And that is now where we live. And the word, therefore, divide and separate is an interesting one. It means to set apart. That actually there's things that God separates in his world to keep them in a different, uh, different place of being so that they can have space to be what they are. And straight away, when I think about my faith and I think about your faith, there's got to be space where we can be what God has called us to be. There's got to be a place that we separate out in our lives where we can sit and be who it is that God has called us to be. Last week, we said that God has put something unique inside every single person. But I I wonder if part of our problem is that we don't create space to explore what that is. Have you ever taken time to just go away and refresh and Think about your life and come back recharged. We call it a holiday. You ever had one of those? They're great, aren't they? They're so good. And then you come back and all of a sudden you can see things with a fresh perspective. You can see things anew. You feel like you can go at it again. You maybe even discover something about yourself. We were just saying in our prayer meeting this morning in faith, we were talking about uh, just taking the moment to stop. And actually when we separate ourselves from our circumstance, and we separate ourselves to be in the presence of God, we discover more of what he's saying to us, more of his purpose. And it's not that we can't do that without a holiday. It's that often we don't take time to separate ourselves from our circumstance. We don't take time to just sit and be. When was the last time in your work or in your home lives you just had an hour where you did nothing but sit and think and reflect and allow God to speak? One hour seems like a long time, doesn't it? It's not. 
And the danger is we then punish ourselves because it feels like you're doing nothing. You ever had that where you stop and you just think, what am I doing? I'm doing? I've done nothing with my day. No, no. You're taking time to separate yourself. You're taking time to take a step back and go, rather than just do, 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 burn out and push forward, what is it that God is saying to me right now? What is it that I need to separate within my life in the way that maybe God separated water from water? He created space for things to happen. He created space for the world to thrive. Maybe I need to create space for God to speak so that I might thrive. And when I put a structure in place, it is the way of creating space. Didn't mean that to rhyme, that's great. But actually, when we put structures in place, it creates the space for growth. That is exactly what God does, and he speaks. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm an anarchist at heart. Uh, You wouldn't think it, and I dread to think what my life would be like without Jesus. Um, I think a lot of my friends and family are also very thankful that I know Jesus, uh, because it means I submit my heart and life to him. I, uh, I make him Lord of my life, and he, he rules, he guides, he leads, he shapes me. Without him, the anarchist at heart would probably reign. Okay, When I see rules and when I see barriers, I want to disrupt it. I naturally want to break things up just for the sake of being an anarchist. Anyone else like that? Where are my fellow anarchists in the room? You're all well behaved. Well done, you. Oh, there's two of us. Come on. We best leave, actually, to keep the order in the room. And uh, now, because I've submitted my heart and life to Jesus, um, he's spoken to me about these things over the years. He's, he's led me in these ways. And what I realize is that structure is not a bad thing for my life. That actually the boundaries around me are not perhaps the things that are meant to restrict me and spoil my day and stop me having fun. Actually, they're there to help me thrive and grow. They're there to help me be the very person that the Lord has called me to be. Who loves boundaries? No one loves Oh, two of you love boundaries. Two of you love rules. Two of you maybe love organized fun. Am I right? Some of us like to be spontaneous. Who likes to be spontaneous? Just go with the flow. Let's see what happens. Don't book anything. Rock up. Don't put those tickets in place and then get upset when there's no space for you to attend an event. That happened at the Olympics quite a lot, didn't it? Just people outside with signs. Didn't organize. But actually, when you've got boundaries, when you've got structure, when you've got rules and order, they do, most of the time, it pains me to say it, most of the time, they do actually help us thrive. They do help us grow. That we have a God who brings order out of chaos. Do you remember day one last week? The world was in chaos. There was disarray and darkness. And out of that chaos, God speaks and he brings order and structure. That is the God that we serve. We have a God of order and structure. And sometimes I can meet some Christians. I meet them less these days, but we think that spontaneous is more spiritual. We think if we don't plan and we don't prepare and it's instantaneous, that's obviously more spiritual. But what we recognize is that we have a God who has gone before us. We have a Holy Spirit who brings one of the fruits of the Spirit, which is self-control. We have a God who has an ordered mind. He set things in motion. He knew the plans for our lives before we were even made. That actually, and again, it does pay me to say it, but structure and planning maybe, maybe is an act of worship. Maybe it's something that reflects the character of God. Maybe actually thinking ahead is something that is a beautiful mirror image of who God is. That actually he is the God who brings order out of chaos. And actually we've got to address maybe what are some of those things in our life that need a little more structure. Who's up for that? The two people that put their hands up saying they love order is who's up for it. There's actually some creativity that can be found in structuring your life. There's creativity that can be found in thinking ahead. There's creativity that can be found in being more strategic about the things that God has said over your life. I think I shared this maybe once last year, but the Lord spoke to me many years ago about ministering and speaking, and that actually the Lord would give me opportunities to speak into so many contexts. And there was a day where we started to serve. I think we were on five churches at any one time. We had seven preachers, and I was preaching week in, week out for maybe 48 weeks of the year. The thing is, God had spoken about that years before it happened. I just didn't plan. Imagine if I took God at his word and went, okay, that's going to happen. Maybe I need to put a structure in place to prepare my heart and to prepare my life to serve him effectively. In those 40, 48 weeks, 
I suffered burnout quite horrendously. Some of it I did to myself, but actually I was ministering in a way where I had missed the structures that would have helped me grow. Structures create space for growth. If I'd thought about the things the Lord had said over me ahead of time. And here's maybe just a bit of wisdom. You can take it or leave it. Pay your money. Take your choice. You can ignore me on this. But if the Lord has spoken something over your life, and you really, really believe that the Lord has spoken this, maybe prepare for it now. Maybe get yourself ready for it now. It might not happen yet. It might be the Lord is calling you into something. It might be that he's spoken about your future. It might be 10, 15, 20 years down the line, but there's no harm in putting a structure in place that will create the space for you to grow and thrive in the thing that he has called you to grow in. And straight away, I think of the life of Jesus. If you've got a Bible, we're just going to jump quickly to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. There's great wisdom in this, and I can say that with confidence because it's the words of Jesus. But this is what Jesus says when he's teaching, Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. I learned a song in Sunday school, which I'm not going to sing for you. Um, But as the parable goes, verse 25, the rain came down and the floods came up. That's how the song goes. Uh, And the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man. Everyone say foolish. Like a foolish man who built his house on, a, on sand. I mean, I, I have a building background. My advice, don't build houses on sand. Because uh, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, if you know anything about building, the foundation that you build a structure on really matters. You build it on sand, it is going to break, it is going to fall apart. The best you can do is a cabin, but if you build a house on sand, it will not last long. You'll complete it, it will look nice, the bricks will be neat, no doubt your double glazing will be in, your Velux windows will look fantastic, but give it six months, give it a bit of rain and a bit of erosion underneath, all of that work disappears. Sometimes the gift of God over your life, the call, the plan, the purpose that he has for you can take you into a place, but if you're not building a strong foundation, it's only a matter of time before it comes crumbling down. I have met way too many people who have got great charisma, great personality, great gifting, no character. Their faith is superficial. Six, seven, eight, nine months in, a year, two years in, that foundation is now that's not there is now evident. It starts to crack, it starts to crumble, it starts to break. So the first thing we see is foundations. If you're taking notes, we're going to go through these just fairly quickly. These are the apples shaking from the tree. Grab onto one that maybe speaks to you. But the first thing the Lord speaks to me as I look at his creation, as I look at him creating space for things to happen, is he sets the foundation of the world. We need the foundations of our faith in place. Libby and I went to the Louvre Last week, I did not try and speak French there because, well, you don't need to. It's a tourist hotspot. And so you go in and there's this wonderful uh, crystal pyramid and it looks impressive. It's iconic and it didn't exist 100 years ago. They built it because the, there was too many tourists going to the Louvre. There was too many there and they couldn't cope with the capacity of people. They didn't have the space. They, they had to build a structure to cope with the growth of visitors to the Louvre. And straight away, I... I I was really spiritual and I thought, Libby, that's like the Lord. And she went, shut up, we're on holiday. (laughs) And I went, no, no, no. (laughs) We're Christians, we don't have holidays. (laughs) Well, it's like the Lord. They've created space for growth. Structure creates space for growth. You see, without that crystal dome, the Louvre wouldn't experience the sweaty tourists shoulder to shoulder at the Olympics, wanting to see the Mona Lisa from a mile away. They wouldn't have had the space. They wouldn't have had the capacity. They needed the structure for the growth. And 
That's, that's the nice part of the Louvre, but when you go deeper, what you realise, if you go right down to the basement, we'd missed this the first time we went, but they have enormous foundations. They're huge. There's like a whole moat and a whole ancient castle under the Louvre, and the foundations are massive. They're so big, they can take the weight of any amount of tourists, even those from Great Britain. They can take the weight of us going in, and they can hold it. They've got capacity because their foundations are strong. They are in place. And straight away, I was being spiritual and Libya had already gone. She didn't want to hear any more of this because she was on holiday. But I felt the Lord speaking to me that actually the foundations of our lives, the foundation of our faith, the foundation of our families, the foundation of our church is so important. That actually if God needs to set up the foundations of the world to create space for growth, how much more do we need to put healthy foundations in our life to create space for God to do something? Straight away, my mind went to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. Don't worry if you haven't got time to turn to it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ, that he is the foundation of our faith. And I want to build my life on that rock. I want to build my life on that firm foundation. It is crucial. You cannot build a skyscraper on bungalow foundations. I've tried. No, I haven't tried. But imagine that. Imagine if you saw a skyscraper. It needs deep foundations. As tall as you need to go, you've got to go deep. You've got to go hidden. You've got to go to the place that no one ever sees. Actually, your walk of faith with the Lord that no one necessarily has the ability to appreciate is so important. The depth of your spirituality is not superficial. And it's not something that's even necessarily on public display, but it is the quality of your relationship with the Lord. The depth of that will carry you in any circumstance. It'll carry you through. So many scriptures that come to mind with that, but we'll move on. The next one is a French word, facade. (laughs) Facade, when you're building a building, you've got foundations, but you also have a facade. The facade is the external appearance. It's how it looks from the outside. Straight away, Colossians 3.12 came to mind. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That actually, as we create space for growth, as we create space to explore what God has put inside of us to be used for his glory, it needs to be wrapped around and clothed with a facade that reflects his glory, that reflects his image. Are we clothed in righteousness? Are we clothed in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness? How do we conduct ourselves with one another? When people know that we're people of faith, what is it that they see in our lives? You might be reminded of last week where Jesus challenged us in Matthew to let our light shine before all of us so they might see our good deeds and give glory to our Father in heaven. Matthew 5, what are we clothing ourselves with? So we get strong foundations, but we think about the facade, think about the appearance, the manner of our conduct, the way we behave, the way we present ourselves in line with our faith. The next one is frame. We have a frame in a house. Your house is full of frames. It's got door frames. It's got window frames. It's got a a frame around the outside of the house that allowed the bricks and the facade to be built around. The frame is the skeleton in which things can be built upon and built around. Psalm 139 came to mind. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. This is talking about what God has done and how he's created us. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Beautiful image right there. What is the framework in our lives? Well, it's the templates. It's the things we're modeling ourselves upon. It's the influences we're allowing into our lives. It becomes a framework for how we be, how we behave. You had a framework from your family growing up. Might have been a good one. It might not have been a good one. I had a framework that was given to me by the church. My family was split in some ways. I grew up between two households, but it was the framework of those in loving community that showed me how to be. What is the framework in your life? If the Lord has spoken something over you, what framework are you putting in place that will help that grow and thrive? The second to last thing is furniture. Who loves a bit of furniture? Love window shopping, love seeing, that would look great in my house. And there comes a time where I might be able to get that thing in my house, but more often than not, I have hand-me-downs. 
So we have furniture in our house that doesn't, that it doesn't match, does it? We've got, we've got curtains that we necessarily didn't choose, but uh, friends and family helped us out. And we've got a sofa that is ours and a sofa that's also not ours. It was given to us and it's a blessing to have it, but it's all a little bit mismatched. And there are times when I can choose my furniture. There's times where it's kind of thrust upon me. But actually there are designs within my life that are sometimes shaped by me and shaped for me. But they do help us thrive. They do create space in which things can grow. And so what are the things that are filling my life? What are the things that I'm choosing to fill my life with? What am I choosing to fill my time with? Am I creating space for things to grow in terms of my faith? Or am I squandering what God has put before me? There is a sense in which the call of God, the plans of God for your life, happen, they're a little bit inevitable, and there's a sense in which we have to do a lot of work to see them come to pass. Uh, Some would call it predestination versus free will and choice. Let's do that in a minute and a half and less. Are you ready? (laughs) Predestination is, some would call it a part of Calvinism, it's where uh, God has already ordained your days and things are going to happen, the Bible does talk about that, but equally on the other hand, don't we get to choose everything? Well, I'm reminded of a story. There was a man who was standing at the gates of heaven. And uh, he'd lived a good life, but he believed firmly that the Lord had ordained every step, every moment, every plan, every parking space he prayed for. The Lord had provided. And so there was two lines. There was one for the Calvinists, those that believed in predestination, those that believed in the sovereignty and order and direction. And the Arminianists who were like, eh. And so these two cues, <laughs> it's a bit more complicated than that. I'm oversimplifying. <laughs> The Calvinists are in line. So you say, oh, I'm a Calvinist. I'm going to go stand in line for the predestination line. This is where I'm supposed to be. And the angel popped up beside him and said, what are you doing here? He went, I'm a Calvinist. I believe in predestination and order. And he went, yeah, but God has also given you free will and choice. Why don't you think about that? And he went, oh, okay, maybe I need to lean into free will and choice. I'm going to go stand in the free will and choice line. And stood there, queued for a little bit, got to the, the door of heaven. And an angel leaned over and said, what are you doing in this line? He went, the angel told me to go this way. (laughs) Oh, he ordained you to be in this this line. See, there's an interesting way in which God has ordained all of our days. He has gone before us. He knows everything. The Bible says he was, is, and is to come. And yet, we still have to participate. We still have to choose. We still have to craft and shape the things that God has given us. We still have to steward the world that he has given us as a responsibility. We still have to steward the gift of God in our lives. We still have to consider the furniture. We get to arrange it. We get to shape it. We get to put our fingerprints on it. We get to put our stamp on it. You can choose the chairs that bring glory to God in the house of your life. Never thought you'd hear that analogy before, did you? (laughs) You can choose the sofa that might bring glory to him. It might be a passion. It might be a, a hobby. It might be a career. But you get to choose. And yet God has also ordained those things sermon for another time. Uh, And the final one is function before we worship together. As God creates space, as he creates structure in the world, a house has foundations, it has a facade, it has a frame, it has furniture, and you can tell a preacher wrote it because it ends with another F, it has a function. Every building has a function, the building we're in has a function. It might be multiple functions, you might go to a, 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 um, A restaurant, it has a purpose. That building is a space in which people eat and meet and greet. You might go to a coffee shop. That building was maybe built for that purpose. You might have a home that has a function and a purpose as you fill out that home. And the question really is, as you create space for God to move in your life, as you create space to explore the plans and purposes of God, when you consider what you're building in your life, what is the function of what you're building? How is it moving you closer to the Lord? How is it bringing glory to him? And straight away, we just think about church things when we think about glory and how we, how we worship and how we praise. But no, no, it's every part of your life. It's your work, it's your career, it's your industry, it's your family, it's your friends, it's your relationship. All of it speaks to the glory of God. And there is great beauty in creating structures that glorify him. And so here's just a few challenges for you this morning as you think about this and as I invite the worship team to come and join me. As we bring ourselves into a place of worship, I want you to recognize that you are created to create. You are created to enjoy the world, to have passion and inspiration and art and all of the things we talked about last week. But actually, you're also created to create structures that will help you grow. That not it true that when you create structures, you create space 
for growth. Just as the Lord created a structure in which the world could exist, here's some structures you maybe want to think about creating in your life. The power of a shower, a shave, and a bit of tender loving care. I thought I'd start off with a good one, but actually a structure of self-care, a structure of appreciating that you do deserve to take care of yourself. It's an important thing that can help you grow. There's a structure of a powerful conversation, the structure of encouraging someone, the structure of building rhythms in your life, the structure of caring for others, the structure of a stable relationship, the structure of an ordered mind, something that we can learn and grow into, the structure of spiritual and practical disciplines that help us grow in our faith, the structure of your day, which will help you grow and thrive, the structure of a body, of a body of people, the structure of a church, the structure of progression, the structure of growth. What are the structures that we need to put in place that will help the plans and purposes of God in our lives thrive and come to pass? Do you remember COVID? (laughs) What a wonderful time. (laughs) And there was a moment when we all had to work from home and some of us were furloughed and some of us were, um, like Libby, you were managing 10,000 complaints from students in the living room of our house. The only person for, for the university. and We had to put some structures in place that would help us thrive and grow. And so straight away, we did little things like, when I'm sat in this seat, I'm at work. When I walk over the other side of the living room and I sit in this seat, I'm no longer at work. That's a simple thing. It's a little psychological trick, but it's a structure that helps us order our day. And so really, as you consider your faith, as you consider what God has put inside of you, as you consider the wonderful brilliance that is inside of you, and some of you maybe even don't believe me as I say that, it is there, it is God-given, you are created to create, but the question is what structures do you need to put in your life? What routines do you need to put in place? What is drifting and floating and sprawling, but actually with a little bit of structure would help thrive and grow? Lord, would you examine us And Lord, would you help expose anything in our lives that is unattended, that is left to wither, that actually you have put brilliance inside of all of my brothers and sisters here. We are created to create. In fact, you call us later in Hebrews co-heirs and co-creators with Christ. And Lord, you've put something inside of us, but also it is to be used for your glory in every area of our life. Lord, what structures do we need to address? What relationships do we need to put boundaries in? What areas of the heart do we need to attend to to create space for growth in the same way that you created space in which the world could blossom and thrive? Show it to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you're able, would you stand with me this morning? As you worship the Lord, maybe make that a leading prayer that he might begin to speak to you about the creativity of building structures for you to thrive. He might lead you into something new. He might even speak new dreams over you. And straight away, the question is, what structures will I put in place to see those things come to pass? Come on, church, let's worship.